Hey, John. Hey. All right, so welcome. Uh, this is Dr. Bodie Timms. I'm the program director for the Herbal Product Design Master's Program and the Cannabis Science uh, post baccalaureate Certificate Program, what we call the PBC. And I'm John Curry. I'm faculty in, in both of those programs. And what we're going to cover tonight is we're going to we're going to cover some of the innovative things that we're seeing in the marketplace when we talk about how we combine cannabis and herbs. And we're going to look at the evidence base. We're going to talk about some of the trends we see. We're going to talk about some um, interesting product forms. We're going to talk about dosing, and then we're going to talk about some companies in the marketplace that we see that we think are uh, exemplary of some of these new these new trends in both uh, product, uh, herbal product design and cannabis science. Uh, next slide. But uh, when we get to the companies, we just want to make it clear that we're not endorsing any of these companies specifically. We're also not paid by any of them. Uh, none of our research, either individually or the research that Dr. Timms and I work on together, is funded by these companies. But we do respect them, and we do think that they're uh, uh, awesome. I guess is the simplest way to say it. So we have this uh, uh, convergence, really, of herbs and cannabis. And um, I feel like because of our longstanding 20 years of working with herbs, uh, this is something that just is a natural maturation for us now that the legalities aren't an issue, that cannabis is an herb. It's uh, part of a whole spectrum of medicinal plants that we use. Um, there are things that we would refer to as natural cannabinoid ratios that exist in the plant. This is a plant that's been highly selected for its psychoactive capacity, which is fine. It's a wonderful recreational experience. Um, but in medicinally speaking, sometimes those high THC values can be of use. But generally speaking, when we think about it as a medicinal plant, um, oftentimes really what we're looking at are in the current marketplace, either a combination of isolates, but not too often uh, the plant that has been sustainably produced maybe has gone back to feral state. Um, and certainly it's not a plant that enjoys a great deal of genetic variability because of that selection process. So uh, the same types of thinking we apply to any herb um, is how can this be sustainably uh, produced, either through wild crafting or growing? Uh, what can we do to increase the viability of this plant to live in the wild and to continue to flourish so that our intrusion on it as a, as a commercial product, even though it might be focused on wellness, um, isn't going to destroy that community. So um, in many ways, too, when we think about uh, cannabis as an herb versus the way we use herbs, um, it's the difference between uh, looking at something like Benedictine and brandy, which is something that you can get out in the marketplace as a drink, an aperitif, and an herbal tonic. So all of the herbs that go into this Benedictine and brandy, you see listed here, right? And um, an herbal tonic um, is something that we're going to put together to have a specific endpoint. Now, when I would look at these herbs just as an herbalist, I would say, um, these haven't been put together um, because of the medicinal endpoint, but rather as a flavor endpoint. I think there may be some elements here that we would look at from the point of view of when was this made? You know, this is made probably in the 1400s. Originally, um, there weren't a lot of antibiotics, so we have a lot of herbs in there that have compounds that may have antibiotic properties. But in general, it, it's not a, a formulary that's focused on an endpoint. And to some extent, that's what we see in the cannabis marketplace right now, where the efficacy for a multitude of clinical needs um, really hasn't been met by growing specific strains. And so, uh, in a, so we, th I, I do want to say that like I, we think that the specific strains that are targeted towards therapeutic endpoints is like one of the um, future trends that we'll start to see increased uh, 
kind of convergence towards as a as an industry wide thing. But there's some barriers to that convergence, right? And there's there's some barriers to the further convergence of cannabis and herbs as kind of like a single market stream. And primarily they're regulatory in nature, right? And so there's the obvious one about like the kind of nebulous and um, uh, hodgepodge implementation of cannabis uh, decriminalization laws. And then in the dietary supplement side of things, there's already like a very firmly and uh, broadly established framework that kind of covers the entire national dietary supplements industry. It's kind of grounded in law and uh, which is the SHEA, which is the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act. And then uh, because of that, like all the herbs from that era were kind of quote unquote grandfathered in. And then like, if you want to bring a new herb into the uh, what's considered like uh, approved by the FDA as a dietary supplement, you have to go through a new process, which is where we get like this, the NDIs and the botanical drug development. And so the problem is that because of the way that cannabis regulation was during the um, war on drugs, basically, th those are not pathways that we can use for a lot of the constituents in cannabis. And then what we're seeing is that we're seeing companies are kind of bringing products to marketplace. And then that uh, went through the process of being approved as, as drugs that can be prescribed. And then as a function of that, the, it kind of creates uh, some ambiguity in whether or not some of the constituents that we see in cannabis can be used as dietary supplements, right? And so there's like, there's a perspective that like, because of the size of the, the uh, cannabis industry, because of the size of the hemp drive products industry, there's probably going to need to be some legal changes. Like they're probably going to have to figure out a way to accommodate that industry. But it's just right now what we're seeing is that it serves as a barrier to like full convergence between like these kind of two different systems of working with plants, right? And then um, the other thing is that the compliance process for both of them is substantially different. So within the cannabis marketplace, we see that you have uh, an active uh, generally in most of the marketplaces, we see an active regulatory compliance process with inspections, whereas the, the dietary supplement industry, and we see the FDA, which administers the dietary supplement regulatory framework, we see them in the last year or two starting to pick up inspections and starting to implement things like remote inspections. But to a large extent, um, the CGMP compliance is something that historically has been something that the dietary supplement manufacturers have kind of voluntarily done, even though ostensibly they do need to be compliant with it. But it's the onus is to a large extent been on them to like demonstrate compliance. And so uh, because of the two ways that those compliance apparatuses ultimately manifest and like what companies are required to do, we're not seeing a lot of companies that are kind of like fully comfortable in both. Although uh, later in the presentation, we'll start to identify some companies where we're seeing some notable exceptions. And so now we're gonna start talking about some of the thematic elements we see in this convergence between the arbitrarily defined cannabis industry and then the arbitrarily defined dietary supplements industry, even though a lot of the things that they have, in, a lot of the things they share, they share in common, right? And one of the things that we see is that in the cannabis industry, because of the psychoactive nature of cannabis, because of the volatility of the constituents, because of um, the need for the regulation to kind of like very precisely identify specifically what is in the plant, for example, if it's uh, greater than 0.3%, it's quote unquote hot, and it's no longer hemp, it's cannabis. What we're seeing is that in the cannabis industry, we're, there's all these innovative extraction technologies that are being developed. And so we see like, so, like uh, new types of solvents, we see uh, 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 increased reliance on uh, subcritical and supercritical CO2 extraction technologies. And what we're seeing is we're, see, we're starting to see those technologies now being leveraged to like find new and innovative ways to extract dietary supplements. And so when you start to see a lot of the new gummies and a lot of the new uh, forms, we would call them forms, but like a lot of the new methods of delivering uh, like existing herbs and dietary supplements, a lot of that is actually being driven by the cannabis side of the marketplace. And the interesting thing too about that is um, there's more attention being paid to uh, absorption strategies because both the terpenes and the cannabinoids are 
what we call lipophilic. They like to be dissolved in oils. And these things tend not to cross the gut membrane as well and be absorbed at high efficiencies. Um, we're seeing a, a marketplace that is such a, an amalgamation of both recreational uses and medical uses that the, the forms themselves are kind of intertwined. And um, that is driving a lot of these different extraction profiles. And now we're beginning to see that same growth um, in the herbal marketplace as well. So I would encourage you, we've got a herbal product extraction webinar at some point coming up soon. Um, and for those of you that want to get into some of that nitty gritty, um, we would encourage you to, to um, go to that one as well. So, excuse me, um, here are some examples in the marketplace. Uh, John had mentioned supercritical uh, fluid extraction and, and specifically the use of CO2 um, in supercritical state. Um, this is something that extracts um, things that like to otherwise be extracted in oil. Um, it, it does so in a way that uh, doesn't alter the chemical profiles. Um, you, you tend not to um, burn off, as they say, some of the terpenes based on heat. So the, this is a very forgiving form of extraction. Um, it concentrates things in very high levels. And you can see here from a company called Resin Extracts, they obviously um, uh, really specialize in the shatters and the butters and, and the, and the uh, resins, the uh, hash type products, which are wonderful from a consumer point of view, but they're also really high quality artisanal product from a medicinal point of view. Um, now the piece about CO2 really is that um, it's a it's almost considered solventless in that we're not uh, we're using a gas and it's and it's very inert. Um, some other examples of this same approach uh, we're seeing Eden Botanicals, but this is focused specifically if if you look at it on different types of plants and look at the range that they're working with. So they're looking at oils from lavender, from sandalwood patchouli, agarwood, baobab, marula, different types of plants, obviously, everything from calendula for the flowers to ginger for the roots and myrrh for the sap, and then different um, forms. So you've actually got seeds that we're actually dealing with, pomegranate, raspberry, rose hip. So um, this is an extraction process that has a very wide range. Um, if you're hearing heavy breathing, it's not me, it's uh, my... My uh, target lab over here playing with his ducky, and um, I apologize. Um, and here's a, a company new chapter, very well known. And what I want to point out is, um, look at where you've got supercritical extracts for rosemary, turmeric, ginger, um, and then all of a sudden you see a switch to either hydroethanolic, which is a mixture of water and alcohol, or just water. Um, and this point in the red box that I'm noting, um, they, there were companies that began to say, hey, if we can, a tea, green tea just as a tea is great, let's try some of these new extractions. And what it ended up happening is the concentration, particularly of the EGCG, epigallocatechin gallate, a particular type of catechin product that's in tea, and is responsible for a lot of medicinal activity, that got to be to such high levels that we began to see some issues with the liver where the green tea extract actually became somewhat toxic. So good herb companies, whether they're working with cannabis or medicinal plants, they need to know that, that just because something's a great extraction process doesn't mean it's applied everywhere. So here you're looking at a company that has done the research into what do extraction profiles look like and adapted their ingredients to be extracted in the way that optimized that plant extract as a medicinal agent before bringing it all together. Um, here's another example too. Um, this is really where innovation might not lead to a better product is kava kava. So kava kava in Polynesian culture was always extracted in what would be expected to be an aqueous fermentation. Uh, ostensibly, it was chewed 
And in that chewing process, there was some mastication that occurred. And so you had the saliva um, and this was partially fermented with human bacteria. Um, and in, in, in normal times, what you see is you see a hydro alcohol extract of it and you see teas made of it. Um, now, all of a sudden, you had two things happening. You had people saying, wow, you know, this extracts this amount. Let's do this supercritical fluid extract and really start pulling out these cavalactones. Well, um, a number of things aren't good about that. Once you start to get to those levels, again, you begin to see some effects on the kidneys and also in conditions where kidneys are always already weak, either through um, someone being addicted to certain drugs that are hard on the kidneys or uh, they are uh, kidney from exposure to medicinal uh, pharmaceutical drugs or what have you, um, this tended to exacerbate that experience. The other thing too that people didn't realize is they began to look at different forms. So there's a white kava and a black kava. White kava is the traditional kava. Um, it's uh, very low to the ground, highly branching in terms of trying to get to it. It's a lot more work. It takes longer. Black kava was set up in a way where harvesting was easier. It had half the time to harvest, but the phytochemical makeup was that much different. So again, what you need is folks in the marketplace that not only understand the science, but the herbal nuance, the training to be able to take those two together and ensure that the end product is really going to be useful. Um, John, did you have anything you wanted to offer on this commentary? No, I think that was pretty succinct. I, I do th I do want to point out that we, like Kava is just the tip of the iceberg with this. We see the same type of quote unquote innovation leading to um, a lot of other herbs that were used therapeutically for millennia in a lot of different cultures. And so we see this with uh, ephedra and ephedrine, and we see it with uh, kratom and the distinctions between uh, red veined and white veined kratom. And then the uh, newer concentrations of, of kratom. And then we also saw it with salvia divinorum, where before it was uh, recently banned from like most of the US marketplaces, we were seeing concentrations of salvia that could be purchased over the counter at like gas stations where it was like 80x, it was 80 times concentrated, you know, and um, it's just, it's not the same thing at that point anymore. It's not, the, it's not the herb that it was when it was being used medicinally. And so, uh, Going back to those extraction technologies we were talking about and looking at uh, new methods of making constituents be able to be suspended in things that they're generally not suspended in, we start to see uh, new extractions of chemicals using like ultra like sonification and like other ultrasonic technologies where they're able to extract it and then deploy it into a new form and then it has a uh, it can be used as a product that way so then we start to see like changes to the solubility of compounds from that we start to see the um psychoactive effectiveness of those compounds start to alter too and what we're seeing is that the what traditionally if we look at cannabis and then we start to look at herbs that kind of have the same solubility profiles as cannabis we see that like to a large extent, we're generally looking at lipophilic constituents, right? So not necessarily the best things to extract into water or to extract into um, things that aren't like having an, an affinity for oil, right? That's why we often see like uh, oil extractions and we, and we see smoking is like one of the main ways, main, one of the main traditional ways of consuming cannabis, right? But what we're seeing now is that when they start to leverage those extraction technologies, they could start to put uh, therapeutically effective and by therapeutics, I'm kind of, it's a shorthand for like psychoactive therapeutics, but also like the other types of therapeutic effectiveness. They're able to put those into products where traditionally, if we were you looking at the older technology, you wouldn't be able to do that. Right. So we like, if you, if you took the technology that we were able to leverage towards dietary supplements in like the seventies, and you were to try to make like a seltzer drink with that had like some, a lot of the plant constituents in it, like let's say calendula or cannabis constituents, it, would, it wouldn't even make it to the, to the consumer because all of those little constituents, they would like precipitate out and they just form this like oily slurry on the bottom of the container. But now that we're able to 
from this innovation that we see coming from the cannabis sector, we're start to be able to go back and re-examine all of these different forms. And then we could start to make products that are kind of meeting the needs of consumers, whether those needs are like the, the uh, preference for how they take the thing or uh, lifestyle based or to uh, start to see new and innovative flavors. And so I think this is one of the things that we're definitely going to see like more and more of, especially as uh, decriminalization continues to at the pace that it's continuing at, is that we'll start to see the um, the range of products that are coming from these therapeutic plants start to grow to kind of encompass like all of the products that we see in all of the other sectors when it comes to like food and nutrition and um, lifestyle. And so this... Uh, Sorry. So, okay, so Herbland is an interesting one because what they're doing is they're starting to create synergy between some cannabinoids and also looking at the way that uh, products have been delivered in the cannabis sector. And then they're starting to leverage those to kind of create dietary supplement products that are traditionally, we, like, so for, if you look at this immune abuse and, um, and you, and you go look at like what's actually in it. Traditionally, those would have had to been delivered as like a tea or a tincture, right? And a lot of people, some of the flavors in those that you, maybe they wouldn't want to take it as often because of the way the, the it was like super bitter or, you know, kind of tingling and stuff like that. But now they're able to take the, the constituents and they're able to start to create gummies. And then those like people take, people prefer those because they can fit into their lifestyle. They could just pipe, pop a gummy and it, they're getting the same kind of plant constituent consumption that they would have gotten historically from a tea. And the other reason that we choose Herbland is because there's a high degree of variance in the quality of gummies. So like for a good example is if you look like one of the big explosions right now in um, the dietary supplement industry, especially since the pandemic started, are elderberry gummies, right? Like uh, berries of Sambucus nigra and then the extracts from that. And what we're seeing is that like, if you look at the actual constituents that are in elder gummies, like some of them are actually like very well produced products. They're therapeutically um, important. They're actually, you're actually getting like a therapeutic dose of the herbs. And the other ones are basically just like flavored, like they're gummies that are flavored like elderberry, right? And so uh, we think Herbland is doing a really effective job of creating some of these new product forms within the, um, the herbal side of things. And we suggest that you look, look, check them out and kind of look at the technologies that, that they're using. Another component of this too, that I think is really important is, you know, when all this started in the early sixties, the Renaissance of herbal medicine. And I would, I would say that the, the push for cannabis as both a recreational and a medicinal agent really came out of the hippie tribes. And I'm a proud member of that group. Um, and along with that came um, the willingness to eat, taste, ingest things of horrible dimensions. It, there was a badge of, of honor to be able to take tinctures of the most foul tasting herbs possible. Um, and that was fine within that small community. But now as this industry has grown and become um, available really across all spectrums of that uh, consumer market, if you want to be producing something that's effective, you need compliance. You need people willing to take it because it doesn't taste bad, or in fact, it might actually taste good, and um, that it's available in a multiplicity of forms that make it easier for them um, to, quote, take their medicine and still get on and enjoy their lives. And I think this is just something about a maturing marketplace that not everyone gets, uh, but it's an exciting place to be in if you're of that headspace and able and willing to explore it. So Earth and Star is another company that we think is super effective. And what they're doing is they're kind of taking innovation in another direction because they're innovating uh, kind of traditional formulas and they're looking at some of the synergies that have been identified in the um, herbal medicine field. You know, even some that go back to like a, like a, traditional uh, like wisdom, right? And what they're doing is they're creating these products that can meet the needs of people that are kind of easier to understand. So like, like historically, if you were looking for like an anti-inflammatory adaptogen, you'd look at turmeric, you'd, you'd add some piperine, 
from black pepper. We see this a lot in like uh, Ayurvedic food ways in like a lot of indigenous foods where uh, these herbs are combined together. And then because they're combined together, they kind of have better therapeutic efficacy for things like inflammation. But that's like a lot of information. And one of the ways that that could be democratized and could create innovation in the marketplace is to kind of take a lot of those formulas that we know are with exceptions, because there's always exceptions in herbalism and in cannabis science, but with exceptions, like generally safe for most people. And we could start to create these product lines. And, and, and Dr. Timms is going to talk about some other companies later in the presentation where they've kind of gone even farther with the product lines. But what we see with Earth and Stars, we see a high quality extracts kind of being centered around formulas and then the formula and what it's useful for like in your daily life and like your wellness goals is kind of like super easy to discern just from looking at the packaging right and so these are these are four examples you know and, and when you, if you go to earth at star and you look at what else is in these like the cacao one and the turmeric one you'll see that um, if you've studied herbalism at all, like they're they're really well engineered formulas that that can serve like a lot of people. And so this innovation is kind of like building on all those other te techniques for innovation that we've talked about in prior slides, but then it's adding this layer of like product line, right? And then and then like making it simple for people to kind of like discern. And then as they're discerning, they're kind of like staying within the same company. So another issue is uh, innovation in dosing. Um, and this, what you'll find in this talk is that you can't separate extraction from form, from dosing, from compliance, all these things, they all come together in a product. They have to be multiplicity of threads that get accounted for and then pulled together into something in the end. Um, this product, Golden Thread, a friend of mine has put this together and really with the idea that says, why are we, you know, because their, their focus is on wellness like ours, you know, why are we treating the scheduling of how we ingest our, our herbals as if they were pharmaceuticals? Um, why can't it be part of a, uh, an ongoing daily practice that has a multiplicity of forms depending on where we are in the day, what we're trying to achieve, what's going on in our bodies. And so here, the idea is that you might start off in the morning um, with something like a turmeric radiance, an anti-inflammatory, something that um, works on uh, digestion and or something like a Hawaiian ginger. And, and throughout the day, your needs might be different. And in each of these beverages, is a full dosing of the herbals a part of that, but you get to choose how your day flows and what are the kind of uh, daily needs uh, and wellness issues that are coming up. So it's again, it's orienting itself toward um, a very different approach to how do I go ahead and um, meet my quote medicine as something that's just part of my life. Um, some interesting formulary. These are, are 1906. It, what I like about them are a number of things. One is um, they, they have these uh, sublinguals that you can just put underneath your tongue, and so they absorb. They have an interesting way of framing each of these from a label claim basis um, that doesn't get the FDA on their backs, but yet still allows a communication of what the treatment modality is about. Um, they tend to be uh, low dose. So they're gonna be using things like a one-to-one -one CBD to THC for most products, maybe a five-to-one uh, for a chill formula. So again, these are going back to on the THC side, on the cannabinoid side, really to more feral population ratios. Um, and, um, they t all of these include medicinal plants and not all cannabis companies know how to use medicinal plants well. This is one that is doing a really nice job of it. And the packaging, everything I think um, is very attractive. Um, here's a final one. I'll note Herbalist and Alchemist. This is, uh, put, uh, is, is, is uh, Dave Winston 
who is a wonderful herbalist. He was one of my mentors um, at, when I was a clinical herbalist a long time ago. Um, and I'll point out two things that, one, that an herbalist in this marketplace who also understands science can do that someone who's just coming from science will never figure out. And that is nettles is a wonderful herb where you can use the leaf, um, you can use the roots, and you can use the seeds for very different endpoints clinically. And the nettle seeds in particular are one of the few really good kidney tonics for folks that might otherwise uh, be slowly creeping towards some kind of long-term uh, attachment to machinery for their, their kidneys to function. Here's something as an intervention that can help kind of restore healthy kidney function as long as a bunch of other lifestyle choices get made. And this is a unique um, use of a part of a plant that if you weren't an herbalist, you wouldn't figure out, you wouldn't understand that kind of nuance. The other thing is uh, this uh, uh, Fige immune adaptogen product, this traditional Chinese medicine tonic. It's interesting in that originally, this is something in one of his newsletters he'd shared, um, and it was about a, a tonic that was really a soup. It was like a chicken soup that had these, um, a lot of um, medicinal mushrooms. You had some other TCM-based herbs in there, Romagna, uh, ashwagandha, things that were part of a sort of deep immune stimulation that you would take during the winter time. And you would eat these wonderful broths and soups and they were tonics. And I had at that point, I had a health food store in Old Town Alexandria where I was working as a clinical herbalist. And I asked David, I said, would you be willing to make a tincture of this and just see if it works in the, in the marketplace and for people? And he did. And we used to just uh, sell a lot of this product because it really was something that if you took as a preventative throughout the winter time was something that was gonna limit the kinds of respiratory uh, cold-based uh, symptoms that you were gonna pick up. You know what, I think I jumped on yours on this, John, I apologize. No, I'm glad you did. Yeah, for this one, yeah. Okay, right. You wanna jump on mine? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so innovations in research. Um, here's a company, Delic. Um, and, and look at the range of research that they're doing. Um, and I think this is important. Uh, there's, there's some good analytical um, companies out there um, that are just beginning to find their way. The cannabis industry as a whole is, and, and the urban industry has been that way, although I think they're growing out of it and they're a little bit ahead of the cannabis industry for being very derelict when it came to analytical testing. There's something called lab shopping that takes place in the cannabis industry where if they don't get the kinds of ratio measurements of the cannabinoids or terpenes that they want in their product, they'll just keep going to labs that until finally someone says, yeah, this is what's in there. And what they say is a lie. And it shows up on their C of A's and it's part of the, the, the lack of standards in the field right now, but that's changing with time. So this group, they actually go through and they will look at uh, the exact chemical makeup of your, of your starting material um, these folks also work in the vape and smoke R&D area. Well, they'll try to help you improve your vape formulation. Um, they, they really want to limit the toxins involved and maintain the terpene and cannabinoid levels. Um, they actually will go through and, and work with a, a research idea or a product idea and, and develop the scientific backing or rationale for it. And they'll also go through and do some pilot studies to optimize the extraction, depending on what your endpoints are. So this is a group that is innovative in terms of the range of testing and science that they can bring to bear to help support someone in the industry. Um, and this is a final one that I think is just fascinating because it, it speaks to something that probably many of you have heard where they use nanotechnologies or they'll use emulsion technologies. And this is something where what they're doing is they're looking at plant cells. Plants produce what are called exosomes, these ectovesicles. And really what you're doing is you're saying the plant is cell, many of them are, are little factories for making a bunch of different chemi chemistry. And they store these in things called vacuoles 
or lysosomes. And they can be tagged to either be directed to some part of the cell, or they might be tagged to go to the cell exterior and be excreted into the local environment. And that might mean getting into the roots so they can end up in the soil, or it might mean sending it up to a flower and putting it into the trichomes. But it's a directionality that comes from um, actual direction from the cell. And so these exosomes really are ways that um, this group in particular are tapping into the plant's ability to make something, package it, and then send it and excrete it out in forms that are able to pass by. Brains are biphasic. They have the lipid components and they have the water soluble components. And so these now are being packaged in ways that are going to absorb faster and it's being done by the plant. So I think this is a very innovative way of actually taking the plant's capacity to make things and package them all in one. And so then for some other elements of the industry where we're seeing innovation, we see in the cannabis industry, there's a lot of regulatory frameworks that mandate uh, what you essentially can be characterized as like seed to sale. OK, and so what that is, is that um, they have to have like track and trace and they have to be able to kind of like trace it all the way back to the soil so that if there's an adverse event or there's a problem with the product, they can identify the growers. And that's just part of the industry. And what we're seeing is that <clears throat> as that technology and, and like not to get off topic, but things like blockchain technology and some of the uh, sales technology that's used in the cannabis industry, like metric people are starting to expect that level of uh, awareness about like what's going on with the things that are making up the products that they're purchasing. And we're starting to see that like uh, some of the larger uh, supplier, like some of the larger sales places like Amazon, um, Harris Teeters, and like some other companies that are consumer facing are starting to demand that there be this chain of quality assurance that like historically, kind of like uh, before the cannabis industry kind of started to make its mark on this part of the sector was kind of just like a, it was obscured to the consumer. Like you never really knew, you just kind of had to trust it, you know? And what we're seeing is that Gaia Herbs, which is a, it's, it's a large manufacturer of herbs, but probably everybody knows Gaia Herbs. If not, uh, they're, they're everywhere. They are, they're actually creating a program that's already deployed where you can kind of type in the, the 2D barcode or like look up the serial number of like your specific bottle of uh, cordyceps or your specific bottle of reishi, and you could trace it all the way back through their supply chain. You could see its provenance. You can see what the certificate of analysis shows, like what actual constituents are in the product. And you could see that it passed all their quality checks. And so uh, this is pretty innovative and, and like, you know, it's hyperbole, but I think it's reasonable to assume that this is going to become like a de facto standard in the dietary supplement industry, whether or not that's mandated through like new regulations or whether or not it's just becomes best practices because of what the market demands. I think that it's inevitable that we'll see like all companies kind of moving in this direction, like relatively soon. And so when we see these new initiatives of quality assurance and kind of like this, uh, like opening up of the, some of the internal quality assurance techniques that companies would use to verify that their products are what they thought. We see that the the drive for this is kind of being done by these trade organizations. And so we see like American Herbal Products Association, American Botanical Council, um, the uh, American Herbal Pharmacopeia, which has created like the de facto uh, kind of monograph on cannabis that's that's used in a lot of the, the cannabis legislation we see across the country. And so uh, these organizations are kind of working to kind of compile and collate and make easily available like all of these different quality assurance techniques, which are can then be kind of leveraged by their uh, their members and the general public to kind of rise the tide and like raise all the boats. And then we see that the same thing's happening with equipment. So, you know, like if you if you go back and you look at some of the lab equipment that was being used for analytics or some of the extraction equipment, you know, in the 1930s, uh, to do like a relatively efficient extraction of like, say, echinacea, if you were like, uh, you know, working with one of the eclectic uh, 
pharmacopoeias companies, you know, like in Ohio back in the day, it, it was a, a whole, took a whole room, you know, and there'd be all this glassware and there'd be like five or six people that had to be experts in the extraction technology. And like, what we're seeing now is that because of the needs of the cannabis industry specifically, we're starting to see the, a lot of these uh, pieces of equipment drop in price, start to become more user-friendly. And we're starting to see like ultrasonic homogenizers, um, other pieces of analytic equipment where um, it's being app driven. It can be used effectively by an employee without a lot of specialized knowledge. And, and I, we're going to, I think we're going to continue to see this convergence of like ease of use for kind of desktop analytic equipment, which is going to drive that thing we were talking about on the prior slide, where uh, smaller and smaller companies can now start to create a create an environment where they're able to kind of quantify and then demonstrate the quality of their of their herbal products and their cannabis products. And then uh, we wanted to talk about some other forms of innovation that we're seeing in the cannabis industry and the dietary supplement industry. And so uh, one of the one of the new trends that we see that, we, that we're super excited about and want to make sure that we highlight is uh, companies that are are being run by women and uh, companies that are being run by uh, other demographics that have been historically disenfranchised. And so, you know, like the, one of the things that people are concerned about in the cannabis industry is that we, as, is that decriminalization and um, pathways for legal use of cannabis start to grow, that the, those marketplaces aren't just kind of like taken over by the same people that had all the advantages in like prior and other marketplaces. Like we don't, we're not necessarily super excited about like, just like big tobacco becoming like the main supplier of cannabis to the US market, right? And so what we're seeing is that uh, based on the some of the building awareness in society, we're starting to see that there's a, people are starting to uh, prioritize and patronize companies that are being run by uh, demographics that were historically disenfranchised. And so uh, one of those uh, actors in the, in the hemp marketplace is uh, Moonflower Hemp. So, and they kind of do everything awesome. And then it, conversely in the dietary supplement marketplace, we see uh, Herbal Revolution, which is a, is a woman-owned company. And they also have kind of the same full product line where you could kind of go, you know, the, the goal is to kind of go the whole day and like every single thing that you could possibly need, like there's an Herbal Revolution tonic or elixir for, for that purpose. So I definitely, we wanted to, and we wanted to take some time to highlight those. There's also, uh, um... Uh, black owned companies, Juju, uh, Juby is one where um, this is really not only uh, from my mind about um, the, the focus on groups that have been historically outside the process, but also that suffered the most. But in this case also, this is one that's also focusing very much on um, women and women's health and women's pleasure. And uh, this is not something that's been met in the marketplace. Um, another example of this is the Green Heffa Farms, where um, your focus is on traditional forms like herbal teas and herbal steams, um, and you're getting um, a wonderful uh, combination of um, unique products, yet historical products. And so I think this is something where some of our traditions that otherwise might get lost um, that come through because as Western herbal frameworks, we really have taken things from a lot of different cultures and amalgamated them into one. And I think it's important to honor that, understand how it's made things more effective. And at the same time, you know, unpull that weave a little bit so that we can see the, the unique contributions um, that are standalone on their own that don't have to be uh, incorporated. You don't have to mix um, African diaspora with Ayurveda and Native American all together to make a good product. There are good products that come from all those different cultural and historical streams. Um, we did want to leave some time for questions because we're going to have to log off a little bit faster than normal since there's another webinar that's following us. So we have until about 8.05 um, which is going to give us a good bit of time. We've got about 18 minutes. So we wanted to let you guys ask questions. Um, and 
will point out while you're forming them, you can ask them in the chat box um, or in the Q&A. The Q&A would be actually easier for us to keep track of because they kind of appear linearly and we can click them off and we've actually spoken to them. Sometimes in the chat box, uh, a question will get lost, but uh, you can get a hold of me or John if you have questions about this material. Um, you've got questions about our programs if you're interested. Um, we, uh, we do have an intake that's going to start uh, this spring. So if you have questions about the actual uh, process of applying, uh, application date deadlines or cost, et cetera, admissions are the folks that can really help you with that. Um, so why not fire away in the Q&A and let us know, uh, you know what got stimulated? What are your questions? What brought you here? In the meantime, while you're formulating your questions, I'll ask one of you, and, and just to get things going, why does this rabbit have such big ears? Maybe once you start to type, your, your typing thinking will be started. So I'm not seeing any questions at all. I can't believe there are no questions. I'm gonna call on you individually. Alexandra, Angela, Asha, Erica, Mara, Mel, Mashena, Monica, Murtaza, Tracy, Veronica. None of you have questions. Is it a rabbit? Well, that's a good question, actually. Uh, in fact, it is a hare. What would be the next thing you would ask? Now, Monica, you are asking what type of investigational current research is ongoing? Well, there's a, there's a, a lot because there's just so little known about cannabis, right? Um, in particular, if we want to focus just on that. There's recent legislation now allows research to happen more freely uh, with more funding. So I think we're going to start to see that accelerate, but it's happening on everything from production, what, what things happen when you grow in different ways to um, what, what are the, the, the different strains and their, their medical endpoints, uh, what role do the terpenes play, um, what, what can we do to increase the absorption of these cannabinoids and terpenes and products. I mean, the range is uh, amazing. It's also on a clinical basis is, are, are cannabinoids useful for pain? Um, what needs to be there in terms of ratios and cannabinoids or terpenes? Um, you know, obviously we've seen certain, there's another lecture that we just had uh, 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 two or three weeks ago on um, where do we see the effectiveness of cannabis? Um, and they're in certain nodes. And I think we'll continue to see those deepen our understanding, but we'll also begin to see some surprising answers depending on um, the use of different strains that have varying ratios. And uh, Tracy in the chat asked if the uh, ears were for heat disbursement. Tracy, you nailed it. Um, I'm going to send you uh, two bottles of uh, Burgundy, um, and, uh, and, uh, and I won't mention the other products because we can't go across state lines with those. Just joking, joking for the folks that hear this on the recording, this is just a joke. So um, where does one start if you want to create your own herbal product? Um, Mel, I would say one of the first things you ought to do is uh, apply for and get uh, accepted through the herbal product design master's program. Yes. Um, what are the benefits for the use for the use? And I have heard that if you use products with cannabis, you will test positive. Uh, well, they are testing for THC, and certainly, um, depending on the the sensitivity of tests, um, even if you use hemp, if it's got some THC in there, it might show up. John, I don't know. Um, 
what yeah, we had this question mm -hmm. in a one of the prior ones too, and they like the, if they want to detect it, they can detect the metabolites from cannabis to ranges of specificity that make it like near impossible to kind of mask it. And so, uh, but generally, what they're doing is they're testing for either uh, uh, THC directly or, or some of the the metabolites that are a result of uh, consuming it. Uh, Asha, the, the cannabis science program is uh, one year and that's over three trimesters. And um, Tracy, how do you see the different deltas? Uh, that's an excellent question. So uh, the thing that we're noticing is that, well, just for context for everybody who maybe doesn't know what the deltas are, uh, the cannabis biosynthetic pathway is extremely complex. And, and along that pathway, there's a lot of different things that occur that create uh, molecules and cannabis compounds that sometimes maybe they only exist for a, a couple of minutes before they're metabolized into something like farther down the pathway, right? And what we're seeing is that when we start to leverage technology and new extraction techniques, we could start to tease out some of those different cannabis compounds where we wouldn't necessarily find them in that quantity in like the like whole plant cannabis, but we're, we could start to do that. And so a good example of that is um, Delta nine versus Delta eight, right? And so, you know, one's federally illegal and then one uh, kind of has a, a similar psychoactive profile. And so we started to see a lot of um, Delta nine products come on the marketplace, right? The th problem with that and the challenge we see when we look at it from an industry standpoint is that there's a lot of really nasty solvents that are used to kind of do those extractions. And so one of the concerns that we have about uh, some of the different deltas is like what, when we start to look at quality assurance and the safety of those products, like what is the solvent uh, load that's in the product when it ultimately gets to the consumer? And so there's a lot of uh, concern that uh, when we look at the different deltas that uh, the market adoption is being impaired by this like pretty serious quality question. And so I, I think it's kind of an open question as to whether or not we'll see them being used long-term. But con conversely, uh, Bodhi and I both know uh, people that are designing products uh, that have like really, really robust therapeutic endpoints where it's grounded and it's using Delta-9. So I, I think it's kind of hard to answer that question right now, but I, I do think that we need to look at the quality assurance and like ask the question about solvents when we talk about the deltas. Yeah, Asha, I wanted to follow up to the uh, Herbal Product Design Program, if you're interested in that master's is two years. Um, and um, the other thing with the deltas I'll just throw in is, um, I think a lot of times it's just a workaround trying to get something psychoactive into your products in the hemp-based marketplace it's not yet shown that those deltas are any better than THC8. So, um, you know, I, there's a lot to uh, figure out. And, and right now, um, uh, people are still thinking you need to hammer with high THC levels to get something done when that's just not the case. Um, Angela, the it, big ears are really, uh, they're coolers, they're radiators. It's the way this rabbit can um, expose the warmer blood to the air and it cools them off. In terms of uh, getting the notes, um, the, the uh, um, missions will send out a um, message that links you to this uh, video here. And I think they also will allow you to uh, access the slides as well. Yeah, and while, while we're waiting for other questions, like just to go back to the deltas for a second. So like when we look at the cannabis biosynthetic pathway, there's tweaking a molecule so that it um, is not the same molecule from a legal standpoint, like from a regulation standpoint, you can say that it's not the molecule that's being illegal, that's being considered illegal. But then there are other cannabinoids that are like minor that do have a lot of therapeutic endpoints. Like one example of that is THCV, right? And so I, I do think that we'll see we'll see some of those quote unquote minor cannabinoids start to become like central components of products in the marketplace. But I think the molecule tweaking to get around regulations is something that will probably be looked at historically as an artifact of like this era and like the weird regulatory framework that we exist in. Yeah, because those the those artifacts, those 
different deltas don't really exist um, in the long term in those metabolic profiles. They're fleeting. Uh, they may be the product of a degradation event, um, but there are enzymes and there are fragile structures to that chemi chemistry that means that it will change to something else again very quickly. And that's why you don't see detectable amounts of those in a normal extract of cannabis. They have to be specifically chosen for, and you need to drive the chemistry toward that endpoint. And then you have all kinds of issues. John had mentioned uh, issues with the uh, residual solvents that are all really pretty nasty, but you really have issues then with stability. Um, you may have it as a uh, Delta eight or a Delta nine or some other artifact. And um, how long is it gonna stay that way when you ship it across the country, how much is left? And those are things that really aren't being addressed. Um, any other questions? We are at, um, let's see. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, we wanna be able to answer your questions. Again, I want to urge you, um, for those of you that are sort of just being a little bit shy about putting questions forward, or your questions maybe are too complex for this venue, um, or you need to be able to ask a series of questions, um, please just email us and we'll engage in that conversation and uh, try to find a way to answer it. Um, and then as far as the programs are concerned, if you have any interest in those, our goal is to get people in that are really ready for the programs will benefit from them, have the passion for them. We don't wanna bring people in that uh, you aren't ready for the type of learning that we're gonna provide and uh, maybe aren't in that place in their life. So we wanna support your goals in terms of getting to that end point that you're driven to explore right now. So no other questions. I want to thank everybody here. Um, really is uh, great to meet everyone. I hope we see some of you in our program. Yes. Um, again, take care of yourself. Um, I hope that uh, life uh, throws you a bunch of very interesting events that make for uh, growth and happiness and connection and um, that we will see you somewhere down the road. Take care. Thanks, everybody.